Hey everyone and welcome to Church at Home. Can you believe this is the 10th time we have been gathering as yeah, a family wow. at home? Yeah, and as we've been gathering online, um, our church family has actually grown where uh, new people both near and far have been joining in with us. And in our in-person services, uh, when new people come to our church, we give them a gift and that is not a baseball, it is a coffee mug that says you belong on it with our, our church logo on it. And we want to extend that message that you belong uh, to anyone that is joining in with us, that is new, that has been joining in with us um, in these church at home services. And so after the service today, you can go onto our website and click on the link that says, I'm new here, fill out the fields, and we would love to send you a gift so that next week you can be joining in with us and you can be sipping from your yeah. new You Belong church mug. Um, it's gonna be fantastic. So. Yeah. Awesome. On another note, we just wanted to give you guys an update of what has been happening um, with the N Nepal relief. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. We are really excited to say that it has, we have had an incredible response yes. from our church family. And we just want to say a huge thank you. Mm -hmm. We set a goal of uh, $3,000 and we have more than doubled that yeah. at wow. this point without our matching donors who have pledged to match whatever wow. we make. So mm -hmm. guys, that is incredible. We are so thankful yeah. for those have, who you. have contributed and who have been giving generously. We're going to leave it up for a little bit longer. We've had some um, opportunity to partner with more, more mm -hmm. people in that. So um, if you know, let's just get out there and, and send that message so we can really bring a huge um, difference to Nepal right now. Yeah. Now we're gonna hear a word from Henry. So why don't you gather your family, grab your Bible, grab a coffee, and mm -hmm. sit down and let's start church. Well, hey, turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis. Uh, we are at the beginning. I'm, I'm stuck in Genesis in my Bible reading, and so consequently, because I'm teaching this morning, that means you are stuck, and it's gonna be wonderful because God has been speaking to me in the book of Genesis. So turn there with me. It's all the way at the beginning. And I want to focus this morning on Genesis chapter 12, when Abraham gets the call to go. Now, if you remember a couple weeks ago, uh, we preached on Genesis 26, where God told Jacob, Abraham's grandson, to stay. And so you might be asking, well, what is the will of God for my life? Is it to stay or to, is it to go? And it's important to understand the context of these two chapters that they have to do with the promise of land, that Jacob was called to stay in the promised land, and Abraham was called to go to the promised land. So wherever you are at regarding God's promises in your life is whether you are called to go or to stay. First, he calls you to go to the promise, and then he calls you to stay in the promise. We're going to go right to the beginning, to the original call, where Abraham is called to go to the promise. And in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Then the Lord said to Abraham, Go, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, and all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh and Shechem. And at the time the Canaanites were in the land, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would speak through your word this morning. I pray that you would speak to every single person in their house, Lord, where they're at, out and about, Lord, listening to this message, God, a call on their life to go where you are calling them to go, the promises that you have put on their life, in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Well, I've titled this message, When God Says Go. When God Says Go. And I have a secondary title that's really more of a question. Is it gather or is it go? 
Is it gather or is it go? You know, there's been a lot of discussion lately about gatherings. As we move towards reopening and gathering again, there's questions on can we gather? How many can we gather? Who can gather? Um, I'm, I'm seeing my neighbors gather. Can, can I gather? Uh, why can they gather and we can't gather? And what about the church? Can the church gather? And, you know, I've been asked the question, what do you think about all of this? You know, as a pastor, uh, should the church be able to gather? And I have my opinion on this. But before I, I add my opinion to the millions of other opinions out there that are happening right now, I'd like to change the question for a moment. What if God is teaching the church something critical in this time and in this moment? What if God is trying to establish something in this time? You know that the restrictions on gathering have little to do with the mission that Jesus gave us. The mission that Jesus gave us in Mark 16, 15 says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all people. And I think the hang up that the church has had for a long time is that many of us have misinterpreted the word go for gather. Go for gather. We, we have become good at gathering. We have, in, in some ways, interpreted this mission to gather all the world, to preach the gospel. And so we've gotten good at building large buildings, having greater conferences, bigger conferences, bigger gatherings so that we can preach the gospel. And no wonder we feel like our mission is compromised when we can't gather any more. And for some of us, the only time that we go is when we go to church. But the reality is, is we don't go to church. God has called us to be the church and we gather to go. And I've told you before, we need to stop inviting people to church. We need to go be the church. And when we go be the church that God has called us to be, people will invite themselves to our gathering. So I think we have a critical opportunity here to engage with the call that God has put on us to go. And don't get me wrong, I love gathering. I, I love, I'm a pastor, I'm called to gather. But we have been gathering and we have majored in the gather and we've minored in the go and we've become too imbalanced as a church and as a church worldwide that we've almost looked like and, and seen like a bodybuilder that's been skipping leg day for years and in balance to a place of immobility. And now the circumstances that are upon us right now are forcing us to exercise a muscle that we've been neglecting for far too long. So ask me what I think about the restrictions on gathering. Is it compromising? Is it oppressing us as a church and as a people? I think that we're in an opportunity right now to engage with our mission like we have never had before. I see an opportunity to go right now. Go into all the world. Go to your neighborhoods. Go into the place of need. Go on with your platform, with your voice. There are people that are more open. There's a more, there are more open doors than ever before. And church, I don't want us to miss this. We will gather again and we will gather again soon. And it is important and it is essential. But we gather to go. Jesus gathered his disciples and he sent them out. He gathered the 120 in the upper room to send them out to be witnesses. And church, it is time to go. The word of God for the church right now is to go. It is to preach, it is to spread the gospel, and we have the opportunity and the time and the window now. So where's God calling you to go? Where's God leading you? Now, when God calls us to go, we can say no. We can say not now, or what? Or God, are you really telling me to go? Are you really telling me to step out? And we can we can inquire, you know. When I've 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 told my girls to to do stuff, my daughters, and you know, given them a directive, and sometimes they'll they'll answer me with a what, like they they didn't hear me, and I I, I know what they're doing. You know, you can't kid a kidder. I've I've done it all. I've done all the stalling mechanisms, all the tactics, everything, just to buy time to do what I want to do and neglect what God is calling me to do. Man, the time for stalling is over. 
It's time to wage war on inaction and get out and go and step in with courage and with faith. And you know, Beck preached an incredible message last week on the but God moments in the Bible. But did you know that there are but man moments in the Bible? Where God has his plan and his purpose, but man decides to neglect and ignore or go against the purposes and plans for God's for their life. Now, God's purposes and plans are established. They will happen with or without us. God will accomplish his purposes. But the purposes and the plan and the promise that is for your life and for my, our, my life, we can get in our own way. And when God called Jonah to go to Nineveh, says, I've called you to go to Nineveh, but it says, but Jonah went to Tar Tarshish. Jonah went away from what God had called him to do. And we know the rest of the story. That God redirected him back to Nineveh. And I feel right now that there are many people that God has called you to do something, but you have gone the other way. God wants to redirect you. And you may not even know what's going on in your life right now. There's turmoil, but God's gracious mercy and kindness is redirecting you to stay on course. He's committed to the plan and promises of your life. But fear is oftentimes the greatest barrier for us to step in to what God has called us to do. When God tells us to go, fear tells us to stay. Fear tells us to play it safe or to, to wait. And I want to share with you briefly two keys to overcoming fear and conquering fear when God tells us to go out of Genesis 12. Now, number one, when God says go, he's also saying you need to let go. You need to let go of things that are holding you back, things that are not helping you, things that are, that are holding you down to go. Listen to what it says here. It says, the Lord said to Abraham, go, go from your country, your people, and your father's house. Notice how it says, before he shows him where he's gonna go, he shows him where he's going from. I need you to go from your country, from your father's house, so that I will take you into the land that I'm showing you. God wants us to let go of some things. He wants us to be free from some things before he can take us into the new thing that he has prepared for you. There's some things that you cannot take with you. You cannot check those bags on the plane. They are not coming with, they're not getting through customs on this trip. God is calling you to let go in this time of things that you've been holding on for far too long. Now, it's interesting that he says, leave your father's house. And you know, you got to take in consideration that Abraham is 75 years old. So it's about high time that he can leave his father's house and move out to a new land. And don't get me wrong. God is for family. God is, is for, he, he created family and family is so good. But sometimes family is synonymous with what is familiar. And God wants to free some people of what is familiar to them that is holding them back. Even in my own life, when I was young, I have a wonderful family. God has blessed me with a wonderful mom and dad, loving mom and dad. But God called me to go and move overseas for two years, not because he wanted me to get away from my family and from my friends and things that were so good, because he wanted me to get away from what is familiar, to become fully dependent on him. And then I returned, but not to what is familiar. I returned with a whole new dependence on God and what he's calling me into. God wants you to go and to let go of things that are crutches and things that we depend on other than him. God wants us to let go and God also wants us to just let it go. Now there's a difference between letting it go and just letting it go. We need to just let some things go, some grievances, some unforgiveness, some things that have been poisoning and making us embittered for too long that are hindering us from the call and the, the race that we've been called to do. It's time to just let it go. Even as I say that, there's some things that, that the Holy Spirit is bringing to your mind 
some relationships, some pain, some offenses that God's saying, it's time to just let it go because I want to take you into something new and I want to take you into the promises that I have called you to do, but you just got to let it go. So number one, when God says go, he also says you need to let go. You need to leave some things behind so I can take you into the new. And number two, and this is, this is one of my favorites and so powerful. When God says go, he's really saying, let's go together. Now, when kings and queens would send explorers onto new conquests or new expeditions in the age of exploration, they would send them. They would send Christopher Columbus by himself and say, report back. Let us know how it goes, but you're on your own. That's not the same, and that is not true with God. When God says go, he says, we're gonna do this together. I'm gonna go with you, I'm gonna go before you, and I'm also gonna bring people alongside you. Abram went with his wife Sarai. He also went with his nephew Lot. God brought a company around him. And so if you're wondering, God wants to bring me into the new thing, God wants me to step out and what he's called me to step out into, you need to know and take heart that God is gonna go with you, but also God is gonna bring people beside you. God is gonna bring a brother and a sister to hold and lock arms together. That This work is not something that you're doing alone, but this is a work that God is calling all of us to take part into. And God brings special and unique people in the body of Christ to surround and encourage you. You know, the reality of a new land is that there is no reference point. And I think that we have a lot in common with Abraham right now. That all of us, the world is in a new area. We're in, a, we're in new territory. And the issue that we're facing right now is there are no reference points to this new land. We can't look back necessarily and say, well, we've been through this before. Oh yeah, remember that time when everybody had to shelter in place and the whole economy, the whole world economy and everything just shut down. We've been through this before and we know how to handle this. No, the reference points are not there. This is all brand new. When you go into a new land, there are not familiar things that you look to. But when you go into a new land in a new territory with God, there's one reference point and it's God's voice, it's God's guidance, and it is God's faithfulness. And so when God says, Abraham, I'm gonna bring you into a new land that I will show you and I will establish my promise with you. I will be with you. I will bless you. I am with you. And lately, you know, as the weather has changed, I've been getting out biking with my daughters and we've been exploring some new trails and some new areas and some new territories up at Galbraith. And it's been such a joy to go up there with them. But you know, I've been leading my girls on that and you know, my girls are ambitious, especially the older ones, and they like to get out ahead and they'll get to a fork in the road, but they've got to wait for me because they have no reference point to the new area and the new territory that they're exploring until I get there and I show them the way. The same is with our Heavenly Father, that we need not to fear that we'll be alone, that the thing that God is calling us to step out into, to be courageous in, to be obedient in, comes with the security that God is with us and he will never forsake us and God will have us succeed. Let's stay in prayer. Let's stay in his word to keep that reference point clear, to keep our guidance clear in a time and a land where we have no other area or, or gauge or metric to measure by except God and his voice alone. Abraham went and he went with the confidence that God was gonna to speak to him and guide him and lead him. Church, I'm excited and I believe we're in an opportune time to mobilize. We're in an opportune time to engage with our mission, like I said before, like never before. But we've gotta stay in step with what the Spirit is saying. We can't look to the left or to the right or be distracted in all the noise that's taking place. We've gotta stay crystal clear and laser focused on what Jesus has called us to do and he has made it clear, go. He's called us to go. Where are the open doors in your life? Where are the areas that God is calling you to go? It's not 
time to do nothing. It's not time to just wait. It's time to be active. It's time to minister. It's time to build the kingdom of God in a way that we have not seen before. And I am so excited. My faith is built by the opportunities all around. You know that Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church and he has never stopped building it ever since. Our job as Christians is to say, God, how are you building today? How are you building in this time? And to agree with it and submit and be obedient to it. I wanna pray for you. God, right now I'll pray for every single one of us. Every single one of us, Lord, that are hearing the word, God, are being stirred by what you've called us to do. I know there are people out there, God, that, that you have shown them what you want them to step into. God, there are business people out there that know that their business is for kingdom impact. I pray for courage and I pray for confidence in the things that you have called them to do. Lord, there are families out there, Lord, that you've called them to, to move and, and direct them in a new way. I pray for your voice to be clear. Lord, there are individuals out there, God, that you're, you're calling them to step out and they're feeling alone. I pray that you would ensure and you would um, comfort them with the fact that they are not alone, that they are never alone and God is with them. I pray for every single person right now to come in to a new excitement faith that you are doing a great work, that you never tire and you never sleep. And God, that you are building something great and the harvest is ripe and it's time for us to go. I pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hey, Steve. I've been looking for you everywhere. What are you doing out here? Hi. I'm, I'm sad. Oh, why are you so sad, Steve? <laughs> well, well, it's all Harry's fault. Oh, you sound very mad. What happened? Well, I had been working on my domino maze. It was so awesome. I'd been working on it for hours every day for weeks. Anyway, I told Harry about it, so he wanted to come and take a look, but just before I could tell him not to touch it, he touched it. Within seconds, all of my hard work was gone, flattened. Oh, Steve, that must have been very disappointing. I'm mad, so mad. I'm a sloth. It literally took me weeks. You know, Steve, this reminds me of a Bible story. Can I share it with you? Sure, I guess, but I'm still mad. Well, maybe we can learn something from our friends and, and maybe it'll help you forgive Harry. I don't think so, Beck, but we'll see. Well, have you ever heard of the story of Jonah and the whale? Yes, but what does that have to do with me and my domino? Well, do you remember how God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, but instead he got on a boat and he went in the opposite direction? Yeah, I still don't see how what Harry did reminds you of this story. 
well, Steve, you sure are in a hurry today for a sloth. Well, you know, what happened when Jonah got on the boat and chose to not to follow God's way for him? Do you remember? A big storm came and almost destroyed the boat Jonah was on. That's right, Steve. Jonah was on the boat headed for Tarshish. And suddenly, a mighty storm came upon the boat. The sailors were terrified. They threw their belongings overboard to try and lighten up the boat. But it just kept on sinking. Jonah knew at this point that his choices had caused this great and powerful storm and that if he didn't take responsibility, his choices were going to make the boat and everybody in it sink. So Jonah told the sailors to throw him overboard. Jonah knew that the storm was only there because he had been disobedient to God and he was supposed to be in Nineveh and not on his way to Tarshish. Heck. Yes, Steve? I still don't get how it reminds you of me and my dominoes. Well, Steve, just like Jonah's choices had a huge effect on the sailors, they almost drowned. Our choices can affect people too. Like Harry's choice to poke that first domino affected not only the first domino, but then the second domino, all the way until it hit you. It made you very, very sad and mad. And I bet you didn't feel like playing with Harry anymore. I was reminded that our choices don't just affect us, they affect the people around us. Even our good choices, like when I choose to be kind. The kindness that I share with people will affect them and sometimes even people around them. Uh, hi guys. Oh, hey Harry. <sighs> oh, Steve, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to ruin your domino maze. Yes, you did. I saw you poke it. Well, I did poke it, but I wasn't trying to hurt you. I'm just really, really sorry. Can you forgive me? Yes, Harry. I forgive you. Well, I am really glad you two worked that out. Harry, why don't we go inside and help Steve fix his maze and we'll all build it together. You betcha. Okay, come on, guys. Hey, church. I uh, hope you're having a great Sunday so far. And I want to read you a quote, which I love, and um, it's by Pascal. It says, There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the Creator made known through Jesus Christ. I love this passage because I feel like it speaks to the innate desire in each one of us to truly know God's love. I believe there's a hunger and a thirst in every single person for that perfection of God, for the fullness of who he is. It's a hunger and a thirst. And um, I love Psalm 42. It's one of my favorite Psalms. It says, as the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I go and stand before him? And I actually love the passion. That was the new living. I really love the passion translation too. Go have a read of that. But um, again, this speaks to where we put our longing. Each of us have a longing. And I've been kind of thinking about being in quarantine and, and being hungry in quarantine. And, and uh, I've been putting my hunger towards junk food way too much, but it doesn't have a good um, effect on my physical body. And so I've been trying to train myself to, to enjoy nourishing food more. So direct my hunger towards nourishing my body. And I know maybe some of you had that same struggle too. But um, I believe it's the same thing spiritually, is that we need to direct our hunger. We all have a hunger for, for God's love, but we need to make sure we're directing that towards Him, that we're longing after Him, that we're thirsting after Him, and not spiritual junk food, but to God, who is the only one who can fill those desires in that vacuum 
in our hearts. Um, and I love, as we close here, I love Matthew 5, 6, because it says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. So let's just hunger after God's presence as we go into this time of worship and just really enter in. God bless.
time home. And holy, 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 Jesus, I love you, Jesus, I
team for leading us in worship in our homes and uh, thank you for joining in with us uh, before we close I just want to let you know that we have live prayer this Wednesday at 6 p.m. Um, you have been sending in prayer requests we're praying and covering those um, keep doing that we want to stand together we want to know what's going on uh, we're looking forward to to the rollout of gathering in person and reopening as the weeks come. And so stay tuned for details on that. And we're gonna close with prayer. So Father, I just thank you for um, the ministry that took place today. Mm -hmm. And Father, I just ask that you would meet everybody in their home. This, yeah. Just today, this morning, whenever it is that they're viewing this, Lord, that you would just be with them, that they would encounter you in a new way, Father. Yeah. And Lord, specifically, Lord, I just would love to pray for Heather Capristo, Father, yeah. that you would be with her, Lord, that your angels would just be a hedge of protection around her as she um, looks after her mom and as she is um, dealing with having to navigate um, the, the situation she's in, Father, with, with her mom still being positive, Lord, I just ask that you would just protect her, yeah, Lord, that you right. would just deal with yeah. any fear, Father. Lord, that um, you just, Lord, increase her immunity right now. Increase her immune system, Lord, um, that this won't even touch her, Father. Yeah. 
Yeah. In your name we pray. We pray for every um, person this week that they would have a blessed week. Mm-hmm. That, um, Lord, that you would deal with fear, Father, in our hearts this week, Lord. That, that your Holy Spirit, the person of Jesus, would come and reside with us this week. That we could lean into who it is that you are, yeah. Father. Yeah. So we just thank you. We honor you here this morning. In your name, amen. Amen. Bye, church.